Let's talk about the business of buying businesses. Hello, my friend, and welcome to the Sales Podcast. I'm Wes Schaefer, the Sales Whisperer, your host. Today, we have a lovely chat from across the pond. His name is Carl Allen. This guy gets into the business of buying and selling businesses. Uh, And he makes it look easy. And the way he laid things out, uh, it is kind of easy. Uh, I actually did a little experiment. We'll talk about it at the end. Uh, you'll hear uh, as we wrap things up, and it is working out quite well. He was pretty accurate in his prediction of what would happen when I put it out to my network that I am interested in buying a business. So um, really interesting. Um, he's a good guy, smart guy, good grief, um, doing some big deals uh, and things that you can emulate. We get into uh, the recommended action steps um, you have to follow for the first 100 days of a business. Uh, what is the value of buying a business rather than founding one? And that was pretty um, enlightening, shall we say. Uh, what criteria do you recommend people have when deciding what kind of business to buy? I, mean, I asked him some specific questions. That's the nice thing about this podcast. I can be a guinea pig and ask them, what should I do? And I did, uh, as well as what others should do as well. So you're in for a treat with this episode. Uh, If you want to continue the dialogue and you have additional questions, come visit us at theimplementors.com. It's our free Facebook group. Come hang out, ask questions, engage. Uh, I'm happy to help as much as I can there. Uh, And if you want additional uh, professional, you know, not that the implementer is not professional because you're getting me, you're getting other people. But if you need targeted focused assistance on growing your sales. And we get into that uh, in this interview as well. Um, But sales is where it's at. Nothing happens until a sale is made. Join the Make Every Sale program, makeeverysale.com. 41 videos are recorded. Uh, There's a workbook. Uh, There's an additional private group. You can ask even more questions. So avail yourself of that opportunity. It's with a money-back guarantee. So go do that. Would you pretty please make every sale.com. Now let's bring on our guest. Carl Allen, all the way from the UK. We were going to talk about business, but I want to talk about the royal wedding, man. Can we can we talk about that? Come on. Yeah. What do you think? Huh? Are you now look? I'm from the I'm from the group, you know, my friends were like, hey, we stopped caring about royal weddings in 1776. But that's not very friendly, is it? No, so it's really interesting, right? I, I was actually on a weekend trip with my wife, the weekend just gone, and my my, my son who's 10, he was on a, a French trip with school. So I was forced to sit down and watch the royal wedding. And I really enjoyed it because like Prince Harry, he's like the rock star prince. And he's marrying, in my opinion, one of the hottest people I've ever seen. You know, she's the actress in Suits, one of my favorite shows. That is a good um, show. You know, I grew up in the whole corporate M&A world, so I get that stuff. And uh, it was just great. But it's great that we have, you know, a royal family. You know, I think it really adds a lot of value to the UK. And, you know, it generates billions and billions of pounds for our economy. You know, people love you know, I world. thought I thought that was Dale Earnhardt Jr. What, what that was actually Prince Harry. Prince Harry, yeah. <laughs> oh, okay. I, I get them kind of mixed up, but you know, I'm a NASCAR fan too. So oh, okay, cool. Next time you come over, we we'll have to go to a race, and it's you know, it's go it's for a it. Little, little more complex than just go fast, turn left. But but I digress. Okay. <laughs> so man, you've done uh, you've done some cool things in the business world, right? Uh, yeah. Buying and selling businesses. Uh, what do we have here? Blah 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 transactions worth over $50 billion on, on corporate deal making, over 250 acquisitions and sales. So I do want to talk big business, but a lot of my listeners are more small business. Yeah. Uh, you know, they're, they're salespeople trying to make deals like that, or they're entrepreneurs trying to launch a business, yeah. uh, or they're salespeople, you know, in a smaller business. And so by all means, I want everybody to be doing super big deals if they yeah. want to. Yeah, but usually it's that it's that starting right. It's that it's that first year, first two years, first hundred days, right? I think you've got a you had a question in here about you know the what are the what can a business owner do in those first hundred days? Yeah. Uh, so in all of these transactions and, and you buying and selling businesses, I mean, what have you seen um, that people need to get right from the beginning? 
Yeah. So before I answer that, let just, let me really quickly kind of tell you my story. So okay. I, I, I grew up really on Wall Street. So back in 1992, I, I went into corporate mergers and acquisitions. And I, you know, I did that for many, many years. I, I did some massive, massive deals. You know, I was doing deals for IBM, for Boeing, GE, Lockheed Martin, all those guys. And then uh, I, I went to business school in Chicago and then I worked in private equity. These are guys that invest in startup businesses. And then um, I invested in a software company, which I sold to HP, and I went with the deal. So I was one of corporate HP's M&A guys flying all over the world doing deals. And um, but my life massively changed like 10 years ago. I, I was doing a deal in Moscow. My wife was 36 weeks pregnant, and I got the dreaded call. You know, when the phone rings and your wife's gone into labor, and you're thousands of miles away from home. So I literally ran out of the boardroom, jumped in a cab, got on a plane, literally walked into the hospital five minutes before my little son, Josh, was, was, was born. And uh, I realized at that time that, you know, I didn't want to be a corporate slave anymore. I'd been flying all over the world. I was earning a lot of money, but um, I wanted to kind of do my own deals. And all my training, all the methods that I'd used, buying businesses for other people, albeit much bigger businesses, um, are completely related to doing small deals. And small deals are where it's at. You know, the market is insane. There's, there's millions of businesses for sale. There's over 2 million businesses for sale right now in North America. And that's really driven by the kind of baby boomer phenomenon. You know, there's 10,000 baby boomers retiring every day, according to the Wall Street Journal. And Forbes tell us 19% own small businesses and they just can't sell them. Only one in 13 will, will actually sell. So my mission is to help entrepreneurs, not just in the U.S., but all over the world, you know, get out of corporate America, uh, get out of their cubicle and go and own their own small business. Because when you buy an existing business, it's so much easier, quicker and far less risky to buy a business that someone's built and doesn't want anymore than going out and starting from scratch. So, you know, whereas if you wanted to, you know, if you wanted a Tesla, you know, would you go out and buy the, buy the metal, buy the glass, buy the wheels, the tires, the battery, the steering wheel, and build it yourself in your garage? Or would you go to the dealership and buy one and finance the purchase? That's, that's what you do. And it's exactly the same in, in, in buying a small business, you know, what really kind of disturbs me in a way is last year, 2017, in the United States alone, more than 6 million entrepreneurs started a brand new business from scratch. And Michael Gerber tells us, who's the author of the E-Myth, 96% of those will fail inside of 10 years. 50% will fail inside of the first year. So if the odds are so massively stacked against you, making it successful with a startup, it's so much easier to go and buy an existing business. And in a lot of cases, you can buy the business without having to spend your own personal money. You can use other people's money. It's basically the seller of the business, and you can use the business's assets to get that deal done. So getting the deal done is actually simpler than then running the business. You know, you need to buy a business that you've got some experience in, you've got some passion for. And, you know, we're not talking about the best businesses in the world, but we're not talking about distressed businesses either. We're, we're talking about good businesses that you can make great businesses. So in that 100 days, it's all about getting the right systems and processes in place. It's all about managing your working capital. And it's all about injecting some growth inside of the business so that you can buy a business, grow it, and then sell it. And then that's where, you know, you're going to make the serious money. Yeah, you know, I've known a couple of business brokers here where I live. You know, we were talking before we hit record. And, you know, this Temecula Valley, there's, there's over 200,000 people right here. And within, I don't know, 20 miles, I mean, there's a million people, yeah. you know, when you get into North uh, San Diego County, uh, go a little farther North uh, up to Corona. And, and, and like I said, I've known some business brokers, but it's, I've never spoken with them in, in too much detail. I get some of their emails, um, 
but I mean, can can I find a deal through a local business broker like that? Or do I need a specialist? Is that what you specialize in? Do you help people find the business or would you coach someone like me on what to look for to buy a business? So both. So what's really interesting is the best deals to be done. And what, what we're talking about here, Wes, is, is, some, is the concept of something called a leveraged buyout, an LBO. So it's basically buying a small business using financing that is secured against the business itself. So it's not you going out, calling the bank, raising the money. It, it's about the business doing it so that you can you can buy it. And, you know, we, we did those on Wall Street back in the day, and they still do them today. Now, the best deals to do are deals what we call off-market. So these are businesses that you find um, without going to brokers. You know, brokers really don't have a good reputation. Um, you know, you can go to bizbysell.com, which is an online website. It aggregates a lot of the smaller brokers in the country. There's probably 100,000 businesses for sale on there alone. And you can say, hey, I want to buy um, a web design agency within 25 miles of La Jolla, California, and it will show you the listings. And, you know, you can click, you'll get the information, and, and you can go meet them, start making offers. But, but bro- brokers are trained, really, to sell businesses to competitors, uh, because the seller's going to get more money than you would typically be able to offer through a leverage buyout. So competitors will pay more for a business because they have leverage. They're able to cross-sell products and services between their existing business and the business that they want to buy, and they're able to bring the two things together and take out cost, which are called deal synergies. And you know we, we can't offer that as individual buyers. I do that a lot in my existing businesses. So I, I own whole or part of 17 different companies and we're doing bolt on acquisitions all the time. So we are, we are trade buyers. But generally when you're doing your first deal, you, know, you want to find a business that is a good business, but the seller has got some form of distress. So for whatever reason, you know, they're, they're keen to exit the business. They could be sick. They could be burnt out. They could be frustrated, run out of ideas. They want to retire. Um, and because there's not a lot of buyers for those types of businesses, then you can structure those deals, you know, in, in an LBO way, in a creative way, so that you don't necessarily have to invest your own money to actually take so ownership. Why, why aren't there buyers for those types of businesses? If it's a good business, but it's the, it's the seller who's personally in distress, yeah. it, it seemed like that'd be the ideal business to buy. So we target businesses typically between kind of one and $3 million in revenues. You know, that, that's our kind of sweet spot. That actually makes up the bulk of the market. Now, in reality, the only people that are really going to do those deals are generally individuals for two reasons. The first one is that, you know, if you're a $25, $30 million business, it takes the same amount of time for you to buy a $10 million business than it does for you to buy a $2 million business. So you're going to do the bigger deals. So no one's there, you know, trade buyers or investors, they're not going to come in and do those, those small deals. And the other problem, and this is really interesting, is that 80% of small business owners, they actually won't list their business for sale because they don't want competitors kind of swarming around the business and, you know, making noises. Um, you know, if they list their business for sale, customers find out, employees find out, they start to get nervous and anxious, and that can affect the performance of the business going forward. And trade buyers can be ruthless. They can rip the business apart. Uh, they can relocate it. They can get rid of employees. Um, and a lot of small business owners, they don't want that. They built a business with loyal people. They value their legacy, their brand, their culture. They want that to be retained. They want that to go to the next level in the future ownership. So they would rather sell to somebody like us than to sell to a competitor. But the biggest problem is, you know, entrepreneurs, it's like a cool thing just to go out and start a new co. They don't have the skills or the process to go through the acquisition of a small business. So that, that's the big problem in the market that I set out to solve um, about two and a half years ago. When, when, when I left HP in 2008, after my son was born, I started buying and flipping my own businesses. 
And then about two, two and a half years ago, I was getting calls and emails every day from people saying, hey, you've got to teach this stuff. You know, you need to share this, this proprietary system that you've developed over all these years for doing these types of deals. And you've got to make it so that anybody with some basic business experience, you know, can do it. So I, I built my program and we now have over a thousand deal makers inside of our coaching program. We're partnering with some of them. Um, it, it, it's phenomenal. And we're, you know, our goal is we're trying to change the mindset of entrepreneurs that, you know, don't go and start a business from scratch and likely fail. Go and buy an existing business that someone's built, but they don't want anymore. That's the key message. I want to buy a business that has a corporate jet. Can you can you help me can you help me find them? I mean, I need to travel in style, man. I, I, I actually funny you say that. I actually looked at a a corporate jet leasing business. Um but um you know, great business, distressed seller. Uh but when uh, when I went to see it, it was in Florida and we got into the numbers, two thirds of the income was cash. So you have these kind of rich people going up, you know, throwing $1,000 wads of money to, to, to the seller. And he was just pocketing that money. He wasn't going through the books. So, because he wasn't going through the books, we couldn't finance the deal. Um, right. But, um, but yeah, um, I, I've not seen many small businesses in my, in my 25 years that, that own corporate jets, unfortunately. Uh, we had Probably one. Good thing. <laughs> <laughs> so is, what is the bank looking for? Let's say I go and, and you mentioned a web design company. Okay, I've been in the internet marketing space for a decade. Uh, so let's say I, I go find a local uh, marketing agency and they're selling for a million dollars. Um, is the bank going to look at my credit worthiness, my net assets, my net worth, or is it solely based on the business or is it, is it a little bit of both? Yeah, it, it's, it depends how you're financing the deal. So, so in all deals, there are primarily two ways that you can finance that transaction. So the first way, my kind of preferred method, is you're using asset-based lending and equity investors to do that deal. So the bank is then not concerned about your credit, all they're concerned about is the credit of the business and the business's ability to service the debt that's going to go into it to allow you to buy it. So you're looking at assets that can act as security. So real estate, plant and equipment. Um, but the most common asset class that we use is receivables. So if, if, you're, if, if you're a web design business, and you're doing a million dollars per year in revenues, and you're making $100,000 per year in net profit, then that business is going to be worth around $300,000, okay? Now, that business doing that million dollars a year, they're going to carry on average about one quarter of their annual sales in unpaid invoices. So these are invoices that they've sent out to customers for the work they've done. They haven't yet been paid. Most small businesses average about 90 days. So $250,000 of the assets are going to be the unpaid invoices. You can take that to a, a Bibi Financial Services or a Live Oak Bank or even one of the major banks, and they're, they're going to lend you about $200,000 against those receivables for you to do the deal. So you've already got two hundred dollars out of the $300,000 for you to then make that acquisition. So you pay $150,000 down. The 50000 that's left, you can pay some closing fees and then take a little payment for yourself. Then the other $150,000, you will pay the seller over, say, three years, so $50,000 a year, and that's called seller financing. So that's a traditional way to do it. But then what's happened in the last few years, and it's amazing in America, is you've got this wonderful thing called the SBA. So the federal government, in an attempt to solve this epidemic, you know, 2.4 million businesses for sale, only 200,000 per year changing hands. Let's create this trillion dollar fund and allow entrepreneurs to buy businesses. So the SBA, take the same $1 million deal. The SBA will lend you 90% of the purchase price, nine zero. 
All you have to do is find the other 10%, which if the business has cash inside of it, you, you can use that as your personal stake. If you do an SBA loan, you have to not only personally guarantee the money, which you can insure against so that you're not going to be taking any risk, but they are going to be checking your credit. The minimum credit score is 690 for somebody in the US. Canada's got its own version, and we're rolling out something very similar in, in the UK. But personally, I'd rather go, I'd rather use the seller finance. I'd rather pay 50% down, 50% in the future. In some deals, you could pay it all in the future. Uh, you don't have to pay any closing payment. If the seller's that keen to leave, they're happy to take their money over time because it's like them leaving the business, not having to get up in the morning, but they're still getting paid what they were getting paid when they were running the thing. So, uh, right. so th- those are the kind of things that we do. So I guess the key is how the heck do you find those businesses? Yeah, so there's multiple methods that we teach inside of our coaching program. I'll, I'll give you kind of the, the, the top four. So the first one is we, we leverage a lot of social media. So back in 92, when I was, um, when I started out in this trade, you know, I don't think the owner of Facebook was even alive, Mark Zuckerberg. So the internet wasn't really there and you didn't have all these tools, but leveraging, you know, Facebook, LinkedIn, Twitter, all these online platforms, you know, Google blogs, forums, they're amazing tools to generate deal flow. Um, we also do a lot of work inside of networking. So, you know, reaching out to your network. And and what's interesting is, you know, I told you before that only 20% of business sellers will list a business for sale. The other 80%, they're going to tell four people when they're ready to sell, their spouse, their lawyer, their CPA, and their bank. So if you're networking with CPAs, lawyers, and banks, and financiers in your local area, they're going to have access to a lot of deals which have not yet been listed. We also do a lot of coaching around going to events. So particularly, this is great, particularly for people in sales that are going to networking events and trade shows. We show you how you can research who's going to be attending, do a little bit of research on each of the businesses, and you can go and strike up a conversation. So let's say, where's you owned a business? You were going to the San Diego business forum or whatever it was. Um, I was going to that event and I wanted to buy your business. I'd know everything about you and your company before I bump into you. And then I can have a quick conversation with you to build rapport. And, you know, that's going to blow you away. And then we're going to have a follow-up conversation and I'm going to buy your business. Um, We also teach well. Okay, walk walk me through that. I mean, would you say, so let's say I'm I'm going to a trade show and I go to trade shows. And I mean... would you get some insight that maybe I want to sell? Or are you just like, hey, I like the sales whisperer name. I can do something with that and just come up and say, hey, I've researched you. I've studied your podcast. I've read your books. I want to buy your business. I mean, would you just hit me cold? Similarly, not, not quite, but almost. So what we will do is I'll, I'll, I'll walk up to you and I'll look at your name badge and we'll start to have a conversation. I'll say, hey, Wes, so you, you know, you're, you're the sales whisperer. You know, I love your business because it does A, B, C. And I'm really you know, I think you're a great guy because you went to this college or you support this team. You know, I'll, I'll look at you on Facebook. I'll find out things about you that uh, that I can use in that conversation. That's all about building rapport, stage one. So stage two, then I'll say, hey, you know, can you give me some advice? You know, I want to buy a business just like yours. In fact, hey, you know, I'd love to buy your business if it's for sale. So then you're going to react in two ways. You're either going to say, well, actually... I've actually been thinking about this for a while now. You know, I'd be prepared to have a conversation with you. Probably not now because we're at a trade show, but here's my card. Let's have a call next week or come down and meet me. We'll have a coffee and let's talk about it. Or if you're like, there's no way I want to sell my business, then you're going to feel compelled through the rapport we just built to maybe give me leads and names of people that you know. You might say, hey, I'm not interested. I don't want to sell. But you know what? My buddy, Jeff, down the road, he owns a similar agency, you know, he's getting a little bit tired or his wife's got sick or he's approaching retirement, you know, he, he'd be ready to kind of exit, you know, I'll, I'll drop him an email and I'll, uh, I'll get you an intro. So it's having those types of, of conversations. And that, that's just one strategy that we, uh, that we use. Sure. We do a lot of stuff with LinkedIn as well. 
You know, LinkedIn's amazing. Some of the groups on LinkedIn that you can get into to talk about doing deals. You know, I get an insane amount of deal flow from, uh, from, from LinkedIn. And then we also do a lot of kind of direct approach tactics. So you pick a sector, pick a location. Let's say it's web design in San Diego County. You know, you go and get a 24-hour trial of Hoover's or you go to your local library and they have all that stuff for free. Within 60 seconds, you've got a list. And then you just write to them, write to those business owners in a, a very tailored rapport building way. You say, hey, where's, you know, here's my story. You know, I want to buy a small business and I really like the look of your business because of blah, blah, blah. And I think you're a great guy because of blah, blah, blah. You know, can we have a conversation about how I might be able to, to buy your company? You're going to call me back and say, hey, Carl, great. Let's have a conversation. Are you going to say, I really appreciate the letter, but you know what? I'm not ready, but my buddy Jeff down the street, blah, blah, blah. He's looking to leave. I'm going to sponsor you in. So those are some of the things that we, that we kind of coach our entrepreneurs through, you know, to get deal flow. Brokers can still work for getting deals, but you have to wait until those businesses have been listed for about nine months. Because uh, what brokers do, they typically overprice deals. You know, they'll, they'll, they'll look at a business and say, well, Google's trading at 40 times earnings. We'll put that valuation on your business, you know, Mr. SEO agency. And then at nine months later, no one's made an offer. No one's interested. The seller's thinking, Jesus, you know, I, I, I'm not only am I not going to sell for this crazy price, I might not sell at all. What the hell am I going to do? And then those are great deals to go in and start to talk about uh, LBOs. According to Biz Buy Sell, who's the big online broker, the average multiple um, of profit that businesses sold for in 2017 was 1.94x. So when you when you go to Biz Buy Sell and you look at some of the deals and they're priced at five, six, even 10 times earnings, they're never going to sell, never in a million years. It's so funny. Those are the types of deals that in time we go, we buy for two to three times. And it's 1.94x of earnings, right? Not not gross sales. No, it's 1.94x of earnings. And there's three ways to, cl- to classify that. Uh, the common global tool is called EBITDA, which is earnings before interest tax, depreciation, and amortization. But more commonly in the US, it's free cash flow or SDE, which stands for seller's discretionary earnings. So how much cash flow has stuck to the business um, after all revenues have come in and all expenses have come out? So you're buying on a multiple of that. Yeah. So is it, would you ever recommend or is it advisable, you know, so I'm in sales, marketing, you know, that type of world. Should I stay away from buying uh, a Jiffy Lube, you know, a, a me- auto mechanic shop or, you know, or might it just be an overwhelming good deal? And if I can keep management in place and blah, 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 put some, yeah. put some brains behind it and, and it's good. It's a great, it's a great question. Now there's two answers to that. Uh, the, the first one is generally the strongest piece of advice that I give to the thousand plus entrepreneurs in my program is buy something that resonates with you So buy something where you've got some experience and you've got some passion because it's a lot easier to do deals with sellers and financiers where they see you as somebody that knows that space. Having said that sales like finance or legal or supply chain, or something like that. It's kind of like a horizontal skill set. You can apply it to multiple industries. So you might find a manufacturing business or a Jiffy Lube, and their biggest challenge has been they can't grow their business. And it's the and that's the reason why the seller wants to leave. You come in as, as a sales meister, can really kind of a, a, sale, a sales whisperer, okay, not, not a sales manager. Sales whisperer. So you, you, you're you coming in as, as the sales whisperer, the sales expert. That could be the kind of magic dust that that business needs and what that seller wants to see as a key attribute of that, um, of, of that new potential owner. So right. horizontal skill sets, great, but it, it's a lot of it's around sector experience. Right, right. 
All right, so you got me thinking, man. I mean, so if I'm going to use the income of the business, yep. uh, I mean, that, like, like if, if you're going to go look for a home, right, the, your realtor wants you to go get pre-approved for the loan. Yep. If I'm going to use the business, I mean, is there anything I need to do ahead of time? Or, I mean, I, I'm literally thinking about, as soon as we finish this conversation, I'm going to post on Facebook, Hey, I'm looking to buy a marketing business here in Southern California, you know, doing between one and $3 million. Let me know, you know, send me a private message uh, if you're interested in selling. Wow. If you, if you do that by this time tomorrow, you'll have at least 10 deals in your pipeline. I, I seriously, that's one of the things we teach in the program. It's, it's unbelievable. Same with LinkedIn. You know, you do the same thing on LinkedIn. You, you will get deal flow. It, it's that. Yeah. And it's not rocket science. But I don't want to, um, I don't want to waste time or, or effort, right? Um, and I guess if that company for sale is strong enough, that's the only one I want anyway, right? I want one strong enough that a bank will fund on its own without. Yes. I, I've learned this too. I mean, I, I've i learned how to do deals. Um, I, I learned many years ago, and, and I didn't always listen to it. And I usually got burned when I didn't, but. I like to control property. I like to take control without putting money into it. Yeah. Right. I want to control the asset um, and stay liquid uh, and not be vulnerable. So, I mean, I, I love the idea, and um, yeah, I'm gonna do it. <laughs> so, so hey, so I'm, I'm going to give you a resource that you can watch. It's 90 minutes training. It will give you my proprietary. 10 step system of how to specify a deal, how to find lots of deal flow, how to have meetings, how to, how to understand the financials in under five minutes and how to structure a deal, make an offer, then finance it and close it. Take, take you 90 minutes to go through it. It's at ninjaacquisitions.com forward slash free. So I definitely recommend you um, watch that. That will give you, a great kind of insight as to how this works. And, and if any of your listeners uh, are curious about doing deals, then I would love them to go and watch that training as well. They're going to get a lot of value, a lot of insight as to what this is all about. Yeah. And I've got that link. You sent that to me yesterday. So we will link to that cool. um, in the show notes. So I uh, appreciate it. Thanks for uh, giving me more to do. You're welcome. I, I, I didn't have enough to do. Okay. Well, the great thing is you can buy a business that's going to have, not only does it have customers and cash flows and products and services, it's going to have more people. So right. you'll, you'll be acquiring people that can help you with all the things you're already doing. So um, that's one of the great things about an acquisition. Um, you get new talent. Do you find, I mean, do most people stick around, like assuming the, the new buyer, assuming I don't show up as a jerk or a prima donna and like, hey, I'm just here to grow. I mean, do people they typically stick around? Yeah, and, and a lot of it comes down to what type of owner you want to be. Um, you can be an owner-manager where you want to go in there and you want to run the business day to day. Some people want to do that, but others don't. They want to be an owner-investor. As I mentioned before, I own 17 different companies. I don't work in any of them. Some of them are in Australia. I only go there two or three times a year. Uh, I check in with my general manager, you know, once a week for an hour. And I've given that person, I always give my GMs, you know, 10, 20% worth of free equity just to make them my partner, keep them vested. Um, so, you know, if that's the type of owner that, that you want to be, then really your job's to work on the business, not in the business. Yeah. Um, let the day-to-day -day operational stuff be done you know, by, by somebody else. Um, that could be the owner. It could be the number two that you promote, or it could be somebody that you can bring in from your external network. There's lots of different ways to do that. Well, and that's a good point too, because um, I, mean, I don't want to be in it day to day. Um, and but I, obviously you want to make sure it's running well. Uh, but really, I don't want to buy a business in California. Uh, it's so punitive here with taxes and the regulations. Um, but if I got something maybe back in Texas, that'd give me a good excuse to go visit home um, once a month and see what's going on, huh? Yeah, there's a lot, lot of internet marketing businesses for sale in Austin, um, San Antonio. 
Um, I'm actually looking at one right now in Houston. Um, one of the guys in my program, Michael Nugent, he just bought one in Dallas. Um, so, you know, there's a lot of IM stuff going on in Texas. It's amazing. And as you know, taxes are less there. Um, salaries are less there. You know, it's just a, a, a much easier place to, to do business. Good God, man. And it's Texas. Come on. And it's all Texas. you need to know. And it's Texas. And you know, your clients can be anywhere. You know, right. they don't just need to be in California. They can be, they can be anywhere. You know, all, all of the agencies that I use for all of my internet marketing stuff, um, you know, I've never met half of them. So uh, sure. I, really I've probably met 5% of my clients. Yeah. You know, in 12 years. I mean, thousands of clients. And um, that's the beauty of, of the world today. I mean, you can, you can work from home in, in a t-shirt. Absolutely. <laughs> All right. So we will link to that. So ninjaacquisitions.com slash free. Um, should we just keep everybody focused there? It would, we'll let them start there and then they can find you obviously through Twitter. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, absolutely. Skype, LinkedIn, everything else. Yeah, because it, it, it's all about it's all about indoctrination to this as as a way of life, as as a way of doing business. You know, it's the same for people that that own existing businesses. If you own a million dollar a year business right now, and you're finding it pretty hard to to grow and scale organically, customer by customer, you can double your sales overnight just by buying a competitor or buying another business. That's well, all the, the big guys do it all the time, right? I mean, uh, App, Apple probably buys, what, a company a day, it seems like, if you really <laughs> peel yeah. it back. Yeah. You know, uh, little. I mean, little bitty ones probably almost one a day. Certainly, they're buying big companies every single month. Hell, Dell bought EMC. I mean, uh, um, I think EMC was bigger than they were, weren't they? Or- it was. And you know, you know the interesting thing about Dell? D- Dell was a leveraged buyout. So it was a public company, of course. Michael Dell yeah. found it. You know, one of the one in twenty-five businesses that do survive, and then you know he owned I think nineteen percent at the time. Um, did a leverage buyout with equity investors. Um, ended up you know twenty-five billion dollar deal. He then ended up with about seventy percent of the equity. So he went yeah. from nineteen to seventy percent of a twenty-five billion dollar company. Didn't have to invest his own money. Um, right. I, I hear Dell's going to go back to the stock market either this, later this year or next year, on a $100 billion market cap. So Dell will get, what, $75 billion for free? Man. Now, obviously, I don't coach people to do those types of deals, but, you know, doing it on a 2 to $5 million deal, it's exactly the same process. There's no difference. Yeah. Interesting. You got me thinking, sir. I appreciate it. I'm going to have to buy you some scotch when I come to London in November. Absolutely. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So we will link to you. We've got that. Uh, we've got your ninja acquisitions. All right. I think that covers it. Carl Allen, all the way from the UK. Thanks for uh, sharing some words of wisdom on the sales podcast today. Great. Thanks for having me, Wes. Have a great day. All right. You too. If you were not impressed by that interview, you are a tough person to impress. Uh, I did take a lot of notes on this, uh, and I actually did put out uh, some feelers on my social media accounts and got quite a few responses. Uh, People I've never heard from before, uh, others I've had very little interaction with. You know, I have a lot of social media friends that I don't really know. This one guy's a business broker. So, you know, that's not ideal based on our interview, but hey, Maybe there's some that he's got that are older, uh, older listings. People are starting to come to their senses and are more willing to negotiate. Uh, this opened up a dialogue with my cousin, who's a marketer uh, down in um, New, uh, New Orleans. About to get that city wrong. That ain't right. Uh, you know, we grew up in Baton Rouge, and uh, she's had a business there for years. So she's asking me, what's up? Uh, so this has opened the dialogue. And, you know, that's all you can ask for. You know, we have to sort, sift, and separate. We have to do that for our prospects, and we have to do that for our prospective businesses. Steve Jobs said it best, you know, when he was talking about the key to success and and growth is learning how to say no to things. So we have to disqualify our prospects and our prospective paths, avenues we go down. So... That's what uh, I'm having to do now. 
So I'm doing it in my own business, how I grow the sales whisper. I'm doing it in how I look at opportunities now and buying other businesses and expanding by acquiring other marketing firms. So it's an interesting time to be alive. Um, so I hope you got a lot out of this. Please let us know. Um, hit us up online, on the blog, on the uh, various sites. And I, I'm adding, uh, you know, I, I invested in some training with a coach on growing the podcast. And I've been on these various sites. I mean, I've been on Google Play. I've always been on iTunes, of course. But, uh, you know, I'm on Stitcher. I'm on iHeartRadio. I'm on Spotify. And I just haven't been mentioning those, haven't been linking to those. So I've got my VA team adding new graphics, making sure the links are there. I'm getting these links to um, all of my guests as well. So when they share this, uh, I can go out farther and wider. So if you're on any of those platforms, uh, you probably already are. That's how you got this. But uh, please leave me a review. You know, I've been talking about this for a while now. If you leave me a five-star review, take a screenshot and send it to Wes at the saleswhisper.com. Um, I will send you a PDF version of my sales training flashcards, how to overcome the toughest objections. So the objections are listed as well as how to handle them professionally. Uh, it's over 51 pages. I sell this for $20 online, the, the physical book, but I'll send you a free copy of the PDF. So again, leave a review on any of the sites that you're on, you know, Google play, um, Spotify, iHeartRadio, and, um, and send that to me, send me a screenshot and I will get you that little goodie. All right. So, Hey, thanks for listening. Now go sell something. <laughs>